On World News Tonight, mandating masks. The United States issues new mask guidelines even for the fully vaccinated. Spark of hope. India advances in vaccine production after an indefinite halt. Deadly explosion. Flames rise skywards in Germany after an unpredicted blast. And a Mexican tradition. Acrobats and dancers dazzle with Aztec mythology show in Mexico. From the global resources of the Verna Media Network, this is Other Verna World News Tonight. Now reporting from Studio 24 in Colombo, here's Danidu Vitanawasam. Good evening. Thank you for joining us on World News Tonight. We start off today's coverage with the updates on the COVID-19 pandemic. The CDC has reversed its statement on mask requirements for vaccinated Americans, stating the weekly case rise within the country is connected to the dominant Delta variant. Citizens have now been recommended to wear masks in at least some indoor gatherings. In a major reversal on Tuesday, Dr. Rochelle Walensky in a telephone news briefing said the U.S. Centers for Disease Control and Prevention that she leads now recommends that Americans who are fully vaccinated against COVID-19 should go back to wearing masks in indoor public places in regions where the virus and especially the Delta variant are spreading rapidly. In areas with substantial and high transmission, CDC recommends fully vaccinated people wear masks in public indoor settings to help prevent the spread of the Delta variant and protect others. Behind the course correction, new troubling data showing that vaccinated people who contract the Delta variant in so-called breakthrough cases can spread the virus. Information on the Delta variant from several states and other countries indicates that in rare occasions, some vaccinated people infected with the Delta variant after vaccination may be contagious and spread the virus to others. The revised guidance is a setback for the Biden administration after Walensky happily announced in May that vaccinated Americans could shed their masks in most places indoor and outdoor activities to allow life to begin to return to normal. But with the seven-day average for new cases in the U.S. now rising sharply and tens of millions of Americans still not vaccinated, the CDC is pumping the brakes noting that 63% of counties across the country had high transmission rates that warranted mask wearing. The CDC also recommended that all students and teachers at kindergarten through 12th grade schools wear masks regardless of vaccination status. The CDC added that children should return to full-time in-person learning in the fall with proper prevention strategies. The International Monetary Fund maintained its 6% global growth forecast for 2021, upgrading its outlook for the United States and other wealthy economies, but cutting estimates for developing countries struggling with surging COVID-19 infections. The global economic recovery is taking different paths, with higher vaccination rates boosting economic growth in wealthy economies like the U.S., but low vaccination rates are leaving developing and lower income economies behind. That's the view of the International Monetary Fund on Tuesday, which updated its forecast for this year and next. Overall, the IMF held its global economic growth forecast for the year at 6%. It upgraded forecasts for major rich nations, but downgraded prospects for other parts of the world. For example, the IMF cut its outlook for India to 9.5% as that country struggles with a massive wave of infections this year. The IMF also lowered China's growth outlook, but for a different reason, it cites the Chinese government's decision to scale back public investment and overall fiscal support. As for the U.S., the IMF raised its economic growth forecast to 7% for 2021 and 4.9% for 2022. But the IMF warned the U.S. forecast could be at risk if a prolonged surge in inflation prompts the Federal Reserve to scale back its assistance and if President Biden doesn't get his massive infrastructure plans through a divided Congress. The UK Prime Minister's decision to reopen the United Kingdom despite the rapid rise in COVID-19 cases has proven to be successful. The country which has been facing the worst of COVID-19 is now open and has shown the timely decision to reopen the country might be the reason why cases are now plummeting. COVID-19 infections are going down in the UK prompting some to say it's proof that the British Prime Minister's gamble to lift restrictions in England earlier this month was in fact 
the right decision. Though Boris Johnson himself is urging people not to get carried away by the better infection data. I, I've noticed that uh, obviously the, that we're six days uh, into some, uh, some better figures, uh, but it is very, very important that uh, we, we don't allow ourselves to run away with uh, premature uh, conclusions about this. Uh, the uh, step four of the, of the opening up only took place a few days ago. People have got to remain uh, very cautious and that remains uh, the approach of the government. Johnson is betting he can get one of Europe's largest economies firing again because so many people are now vaccinated. While one of the country's top epidemiologists said the end of the pandemic could be just months away. Imperial College epidemiologist Neil Ferguson said vaccines have dramatically reduced the risk of hospitalisation and death. Against a backdrop of criticism, Johnson lifted COVID-19 restrictions in England on July 19th as cases were rising. But they seem to have peaked two days earlier at over 54,000 and have since fallen dramatically to over 24,000 new cases on Monday. A few things could be helping. The closure of schools for the summer holidays, the end of the Euro 2020 soccer championships and warmer weather are among factors epidemiologists say might have reduced social mixing indoors and therefore cases. While the number of COVID-19 patients in British hospitals has risen to 5,238, a spike in infections earlier in July has so far not led to a vast increase in deaths, which fell to 14 on Monday. The data shows vaccines are working. Over to Australia now, Sydney's lockdown has been extended by another month as COVID cases continue to rise. For more on this, we have Other Than a World News special correspondent Timothy Phillip joining us now from Melbourne in Australia. Timothy? Yes, Narin. Australia's largest city has been under stay-at-home orders since late June due to an outbreak of the Delta variant. More than 2,500 people have been infected in Sydney's worst outbreak this year which started in the latter part of June 2021. Authorities say they cannot reopen until the transmission rate is back to near zero. Victoria and South Australia both came out of lockdowns today, sparking hope in the hearts of the people. Experts warn restrictions in Sydney could last until September or even later. At least one in three cases from the past week had been infectious in the community. There have been over a dozen snap lockdowns in the past year. The national regulator has recently updated its guidance to urge Sydney residents to get the AstraZeneca jab, of which Australia has a large supply. Prime Minister Scott Morrison apologised for his government's handling of the rollout last week, following months of criticism. Critics blame the federal government's failure to secure more supplies of the Pfizer vaccine. Back to you, Nani. Thank you. That was Other Than a World News Special Correspondent Timothy Phillip reporting from Melbourne in Australia. We have some good news for you. India's health ministry says that the country will meet its target of supplying more than half a billion COVID-19 vaccine doses to states by the end of this month. The Indian government expects to have around 150 million COVID-19 vaccine doses in August. The government told the country's highest court that 516 million doses would be made available by the end of July. An important milestone for its goal of inoculating all of India's estimated adult population of 944 million this year. India would not be able to administer all of those shots unless authorities more than triple daily vaccinations to 14 million doses. India has administered nearly 438 million doses since mid-January, the most in the world after China but less than many countries relative to their population. It has given the necessary two doses to 94 million people, 10% of the adult population, according to the government's vaccination website. Let's take a short commercial break. More world news on the other side. Welcome back. US President Joe Biden warned that if the United States ended up in a real shooting war with a major power, it could be the result of a significant cyber attack on the country, highlighting what Washington sees as growing threats posed by Russia and China. 
U.S. President Joe Biden on Tuesday warned a, quote, real shooting war may result from cyber attacks, and he pointed to Russia as a growing threat. But I think it's more likely we're going to end up, as a, well, if we end up in a war, a real shooting war with a major power, it's going to be as a consequence of a cyber breach of great consequence. And it's increasing exponentially, the, the, the capabilities. Cybersecurity has risen to the top of the Biden administration's agenda after a series of high-profile attacks on companies like SolarWinds, Colonial Pipeline, and Kasaya. Some of the hacks affected fuel and food supplies in parts of the U.S. During a June bilateral summit between the U.S. and Russia, Biden shared a list of off-limits critical infrastructure with Russian President Vladimir Putin. Since then, the White House says the two countries have been in constant contact about cyber attacks in the U.S. Biden also warned of the threat posed by China, saying President Xi Jinping was, quote, deadly earnest about becoming the most powerful military force in the world. Biden's comments mark a departure from his predecessor, Donald Trump, who had a contentious relationship with U.S. intelligence agencies, especially over whether Russia interfered to help him win the 2016 election. Trump went through four permanent or acting directors of national intelligence during his four years in office. Canada appointed an indigenous woman as its governor general, the first such person to hold the post in an elaborate ceremony that spotlighted the country's effort to reconcile with its colonial past. Greeted with a wave of applause and cheers, Mary Simon made history on Monday, becoming Canada's first indigenous governor general. As such, she's become the official representative of the Crown and Queen Elizabeth in Commonwealth Canada. We're so happy, like we're finally getting into the mainstream, you know, politics, you know, at this level. I truly hope more Indigenous women and people are part of the process to really uh, start reconciliation. The swearing-in ceremony at Ottawa's Senate, with its performances by Indigenous artists, comes as Canada is grappling with the discovery of more than a thousand unmarked graves of Indigenous children. They, along with thousands of others, were sent, starting in the 19th century, to residential schools, where a countless number of them were abused. Cognizant of the pain of Canada's past, Simon vowed to continue her work to preserve Indigenous cultures. Our country must do more to respect all languages, cultures, ethnicities, religions, and way of living. As Governor General, I will embody our nation's commitment to diversity and acceptance. Canada's Prime Minister also echoed Simon's potential to help reconciliation. We need people like Ms. Simon because we need people who build bridges and bring us together. Widely praised for her activism, Simon's lack of fluency in French and official language of Canada irked some, but she's vowed to take lessons, adding to her fluency in English and in Inuktitut. Over to Germany, at least two people are dead and five are missing after an explosion rocked an industrial park in the western German city of Leverkusen, sending dark plumes of smoke into the sky. For more on this, let's cross over to other than a world news special correspondent Inuko Aponsu, joining us now from Cleef in Germany. Yes, Danidu, a fire at the Chem Park site, which includes chemical companies Bayer and Lanxess, had been extinguished after an explosion. The city of Leverkusen, which lies north of Köln, said at least 31 people were injured, one critically. In addition, five people were missing. The area around the site was sealed off and surrounded by emergency vehicles. Police asked residents living nearby to stay indoors and shut doors and windows. Karanta said they should also turn off air conditioning systems while it measured the air around the site for possible toxic gases. It was not clear what had caused the explosion and subsequent fire. Sirens and emergency alerts on the German Civil Protection Agency's mobile phone app warned citizens of extreme danger. Leverkusen is less than 50 kilometers from the region that was hit last week by catastrophic floods, which left at least 180 people dead. Several nearby motorways were closed, and police said drivers should take detours to avoid the area. Back to you, Danidu. Thank you. That was Other Than a World News Special Correspondent Inuka Aponsu reporting from Cleve in Germany. The United Nations Cultural Organization said it had added the French Mediterranean city of Nice to its World Heritage List. 
The Greeks, who founded Nice in the 4th century BC, named it after Nike, the goddess of victory. Well, it's just won a place on UNESCO's prestigious list of World Heritage Sites, an honour welcomed by the city's mayor. The history of Nice, which is at the same time traditional and open, Mediterranean and Alpine, European and cosmopolitan, has produced an architecture and a landscape that are unique, a model for many other cities in the world. Calling it the winter resort town of the Riviera, the UN's cultural organization was mostly thinking of the Nice of the 18th century, when it became the place for Europe's aristocracy to escape to during the colder months. Not least the British royal family, who decided the only thing lacking was a beachfront walkway. And so the famous Promenade des Anglais was inaugurated in 1931. UNESCO says that for two centuries, Nice's architecture and urban planning have been shaped around making the most of its balmy climate and scenic surroundings. It's still a tourist hotspot today, with several million visitors a year. Welcome back. For more news, let's take you around the world in a minute. At least six Rohingya refugees, including children, were killed and several others injured after heavy monsoon rains triggered landslides and flooding in refugee camps in southern Bangladesh. A matter of days into the Olympics, Tokyo has confirmed a record number of new COVID-19 cases, with the Delta variant fueling the surge. Questions have been asked whether the Olympics should be called off. Japanese Prime Minister has said there was no need to worry as fewer people are moving around and most are working remotely. North Korean leader Kim Jong-un gave a speech at a veterans event, but unlike last year, there was no mention of self-defensive nuclear deterrence. It seems the North Korean leader wanted to avoid offensive messages. 22-year-old Robert Aaron Wrong pleaded guilty to the shooting deaths of four people killed in attacks on Atlanta area spas in March that ended the life of eight people, six of them women of Asian descent. At least 18 people were killed and 10 injured after a speeding truck rammed into an overcrowded double-decker bus in India's northern state of Uttar Pradesh early morning. A number of passengers were labourers and the bus had broken down on the highway. Several cluster outbreaks have been discovered in the reported cases in the city of Nanjing. Nanjing calls the city's residents to stay away from the crowd and continue to follow the epidemic prevention and control measures. Despite undergoing years of civil war calamities, South Sudan has been given another chance by Thai national peacekeepers in the region have taken up the formidable task of teaching devastated locals cooking and crops from the ground up. Near some farming plots, vegetables are being cooked Thai style. But this isn't Bangkok. It's South Sudan's capital, Juba. Thai peacekeepers attached to the United Nations mission in South Sudan have created agricultural demonstration plots. We have to figure out this the aim is to help residents in the Ye checkpoint area grow food in a country where agricultural output has been severely reduced by years of civil war. Lieutenant Colonel Kaisin Sasuni is a commander of the Thai Horizontal Mechanical Engineering Company. Violence erupted in 2013, two years after South Sudan gained independence and is estimated to have killed more than 400,000 people. The country is dependent on humanitarian organisations for food aid. The Thai peacekeepers carried out training on how to grow various vegetables, both familiar and new to the local communities, as well as demonstrations on cooking with them. The Thai engineering company has three months left in South Sudan and on Friday handed the agricultural project, which is on land belonging to the Ye Checkpoint Police Outpost, to the South Sudanese National Police Force. And finally tonight, with music, dance and rituals, a traditional Aztec ceremony was held in Mexico City's Zocalo Square to mark the 696th anniversary of the founding of the lost city of Tenochtitlan, the former Aztec capital that was destroyed by Spanish conquistadors. Founded in 1325, Tenochtitlan was famous for its elaborate Aztec temples and advanced canal system. After the fall of Tenochtitlan in 1521, the residents of Tenochtitlan were reportedly forced to destroy their temples and palaces. Under the moonlight, acrobats and dancers performed an Aztec mythology show at the Mexico City floating gardens in a bid to lure tourists back to the site. The show aims to highlight the pre-Columbian roots of Mexico City and contribute to reactivate the area's economy that partially lives from tourism which was affected by the coronavirus pandemic. 
From the comfort of colorful boats known as Trajineras, locals and international visitors enjoy the show called Pre-Hispanic, which combines dance with elements of contemporary circus, digital projections and special effects. That is all from us here at World News. Join Susan Sijanali tomorrow on a new edition. Until then, stay safe and protect your loved ones. I'm Dani Dutanwasa. Have a great night.